Well, good morning. My name is Todd Pickett. And several weeks ago, Jordan and I sat down together to talk about, in his absence, what should we focus on for our fall series? Because, of course, every summer and fall, we uh, take a passage of Scripture, a book, or a letter, just like we finished with the Philippians, and we spend some time in it for several weeks. So the assignment Jordan gave me and himself was that we would pray and ponder and then come together for this uh, meeting in his office to share our thoughts about the fall series. And uh, I said, okay, um, Jordan, you go first. And he said, no, Todd, you go first. And I said, no, Jordan, I want to hear what you think. And he said, no, Todd, I want to hear what you think. And in his graciousness, I told him what I thought. I said, I think we ought to do a series in the Psalms. And his eyes got big, and he smiled, and he said, that's what I thought. We should do a series in the Psalms. And I said, no, you didn't. He goes, yes, I did. And of course, you know in Jordan there is no guile. He actually did think that. We both had discerned that a season in the Psalms was just right for this transition. And so we then talked a little bit about why that was. Why did we both come up with the Psalms? And we're both reminded, of course, that the Psalms speak to Christians in all seasons of our lives, through all the blessings, the difficulties, the turnings, and yes, the transitions. They help us talk to God. They help us hear from Him in every place that we find ourselves on the journey. In the words of John Calvin, the Psalms help us bring to God the full anatomy of the soul. That's what Calvin said. The Psalms bring to God the full anatomy of the soul. As it turns out, both Jordan and I were familiar with the work of Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann. Um, and he's helpfully discussed how the Psalms reflect certain seasons in the soul of God's people. And he offered a loose kind of three-part categorization of the Psalms. He said many Psalms are Psalms of orientation. Many Psalms could be called Psalms of disorientation. And many psalms could be called psalms of new orientation. So for Brueggemann, the psalms that reflect kind of orientation is when you and I kind of experience life as kind of as it should be. It has order. It has coherence. We have a sense of well-being in the world. In seasons of orientation, God is speaking. We can hear him. Our prayers are being answered. We're very aware of his blessings, mindful of his kingship, his providence. Even though all things may not be going well, it feels like God is here. And there's many psalms that just celebrate his kingship, his providence, his presence, and his blessings. And we might call these psalms of orientation. Psalm 1, which actually in this series we'll do at the end, um, is one of those psalms, right? The blessed man does not stand in the seat or sit in the seat of scoffers, stand among other sinners. He himself is flourishing like a tree whose streams uh, feed his roots, and he flourishes in season. Psalm 1 is a psalm of orientation. All is well with the world. Ah, but the psalms are nothing if not realistic. And Brueggemann said there's also psalms of disorientation, when life does not seem like it once did. When there's times of disarray, of confusion, of hurt, and of suffering, and maybe apparent silence from God. The orientation has given way to disorientation, and a great many psalms express this in one way or another. These psalms ask the question, God, where are you? What are you doing? Among many of them is Psalm 88 that we will look at in this series. 88 is so rather bleak that it's actually not even included in our Book of Common Prayer in the round of psalms, right? Um, it's like, you know, uh, there's also, I also notice there's no worship songs of Psalm 88 because you'd be fired if you're a worship leader singing this psalm. Part of which said, O oh Lord, I cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? And it gets worse. 
Some of you have been through these times, haven't you? Or maybe you're in it now. And we will see what we need to know and what is in fact true is that in spite of those experiences, God is always already present, even though we can't see or feel him. But this is not the last word in the Psalms. And Brueggemann brings us to his third category of the Psalms, which is a Psalm of new orientation. In these, the darkness of disorientation has given way to the light of new orientation to vision, to new hope, where good gifts are discovered, where new understandings of who God is and who we are emerge, we feel his presence again. And we have a deeper trust than we had before. This is Psalm 40, which we will look at. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put the trust in the Lord. I've entitled this series, Under the Sacred Canopy, A Pilgrimage Through the Psalms. This is Brueggemann's image too. The Psalms as kind of a sacred canopy that reminds us that all our experiences All our circumstances, all our emotions, all our speech can be brought under the sacred canopy of God. There is nothing that's not allowed before him to be spoken to him, to be vented to him, to be explored with him. So that's the plan for the fall. From now until uh, Christ the King Sunday in November, we're going to be taking a pilgrimage through the Psalms. Psalms of orientation, Psalms of disorientation, and Psalms of new orientation. And today I want to begin with that responsive reading you did, Psalm 131, which is the bottom of page one if you want to revisit it in your liturgy. It's one of the shortest Psalms, which is why I chose it. It allowed me to give the introduction I just gave. Um, And its brevity, however, is profound. The British... Preacher Charles Spurgeon said that while it is nearly the shortest psalm in the Psalter, it takes a whole life to realize it. In fact, one commentator says this is clearly a psalm of mature faith. One might say of new orientation. The psalmist has been through seasons of disorientation. And in Psalm 131, we hear the voice of someone who has come to a mature place in his journey. We're told at the beginning of this, in the heading, that this is a psalm of ascent, something that was a song that pilgrims would sing on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem a few times a year for the festivals. And the psalm is pretty much divided into three sections. In the first, the psalmist discusses a little bit about how he used to live life. He says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things that are too great and too marvelous for me. In the beginning, the psalmist says, you know, I'm familiar with another way of walking. And that's a way of walking that is a fantasy of control, that I can control everything that happens on the journey. And we know this because of the images he gives us in this first verse. He begins with some images of the body, images of the heart lifted up, the eyes raised high. And actually this word, I do not occupy myself, means I do not walk with things too great and too marvelous for me. It describes his whole person his eyes, his heart, his gait. He once walked in a a way that, that suggested he just needed to control everything in his life. I don't know if you can relate to that. The eyes being lifted up is a kind of typical symbol of pride in the scriptures. We all have our body languages in different cultures. I remember I got the good fortune of living in Greece for a while, working in a small fishing village and I needed toilet paper. It was semi-urgent. I went to the local merchant, 
And I had a little modern Greek under my belt. So I asked him where the toilet paper was. And he looked up, he lifted his eyes up, and he made a little click. It was even subtler than that. So subtle that I didn't catch it. And I just felt like he wasn't answering me. So I asked again if they had toilet paper. And again, I still wasn't getting it. And finally, I asked a third time. And he finally said, Ohi, which is Greek for no. They don't have any toilet paper. I wasn't catching his body language. Here, too, we have a body language of the psalmist who says, My heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high, which again would have meant someone who basically thinks they're adequate for all things. The heart lifted up, the eyes raised high. We get this imagery throughout the scriptures. We get it in several places in the Old Testament. We get it in a description of King Uzziah, who was actually one of the good kings in Israeli history, in Hebrew history. He sought the Lord. He became king when he was 16, which is, that's a pretty heady experience, right? And he had remarkable success in what we might call homeland security or technology or agriculture, both because of his natural gifts and because of his trust in God, we're told. Second Chronicles 16.5 says, He sought God during the days of the prophet Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. He did that until he didn't. And in the very next few verses, we're told that he became so powerful that he began to trust in his power, and that led to his downfall. In particular, we read he woke up one morning, walked into the temple like it was his own, and took over the burning of the incense of the altar, which was commanded as only the priest's responsibility. And those at the time and the Hebrews' readers thereafter would immediately identify this body language as overreach. Someone who was interested now in total control to occupy himself with things too great and too powerful for him. Those phrases in the text, too great and too powerful, are actually used elsewhere as moments of deliverance of the great and powerful God, of the exodus, of God who was great and powerful and led his people and delivered them in ways that no human could. You know, you know, I can throw stones at Isaiah for his um, romance with his own adequacy, his own power. Um, but we have to recognize, right, this is our tendency. Our striving for total control to deliver ourselves is constant. You know, it started way back in the garden, right, when the serpent so brilliantly suggested to Adam and Eve, you know, the reason why God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because if you eat of it, you'll be like God. And he doesn't want anybody else to be God. So the serpent brilliantly planted that seed of doubt. You thought God was your lover. No, no, he's your rival. He knows if you eat that, you'll become like him, knowing good and evil. Can you imagine Adam and Eve's disorientation suddenly? Oh my gosh, he doesn't have me. And so they determined to become gods themselves to exert total control because there was no one else that would catch them. Now, of course, control is not a bad thing, right? We all need to have some control. We should exercise control, for instance, over our time, our finances, our bodies and its impulses, over any circumstances that are bad that we could change. So don't feel bad this morning if you're a fixer, if you're a problem solver. We love you <laughs> in our lives. But often our life is preoccupied with a kind of total control, a fantasy of complete adequacy. And if you think about what you need to be delivered from, often it's the case that these are things that we cannot deliver ourselves from. What would you like to be delivered from today? It could be a wound that is still in need of healing. 
could be regret that you just can't to feel you can't seem to feel forgiven for maybe you want to be delivered from a fear of the future and feel a sense of hope i think we can agree that our competencies our strengths our human resources well these are the kinds of things that we can't deliver for ourselves so the psalmist of Psalm 131 said, you know, I kind of used to live that way. <laughs> kind of used to live with my eyes lifted up, my, my heart raised too high, preoccupied with delivering myself. And you and I know that's a fantasy. And in verse 2, he gives us his secret. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. He's learned how to do something. He's learned rather than to make his chief goal to secure himself in the world, to make his hope to live in God's presence. The imagery here is clear. It's the imagery of a young child resting in the presence of its mother. It's likely that the psalmist on the ascent to Jerusalem, on the pilgrimage, a few times a year, would have seen this graphically, right? Women with children strapped to their chests, walking the long road up to Jerusalem. We're told in this passage that the child in particular is a weaned child. And of course, we know what a weaned child is, right? A child who's not weaned, it's kind of all about the milk. It's all about the milk, the milk, where can I get more milk, milk. But the weaned child is is now thinking, you know, or just intuiting, I need something else besides just stuff. It's appropriate to want milk, but the child is beginning to actually want something more. The child now wants the mother. I want the mother, the strong and comforting presence. And we know those of you who have psychological backgrounds or simply parenting backgrounds, That children who attach in healthy ways in their early years, well, that makes all the difference. That makes all the difference. So now this is something, however, that the adult child, the psalmist, has learned to do in his pilgrimage. In his maturity, he's discovered or he's taught himself or trained himself to calm and quiet himself like a child with his mother. And we get this parent-child imagery elsewhere in Deuteronomy 131. It says, The Lord God goes before you. You He will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness. And he carried you as a man carries his son all the way you went until you came to this place. The psalmist has learned to let himself be carried. You know, it's a funny thing about a lot of the Christian commands, the biblical commands. They're actually commands that let something be done to you. That's a little trickier. It's a little trickier than to do something. In the New Testament, we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. That's a little tricky. It's not fill yourself with the Spirit. That's more straightforward, though impossible. But be filled with the Spirit. Let something be done to you. It may take some effort for sure. It may take some self-denial. But what the psalmist has learned to do, he's learned to do a certain set of things that make it more likely that he would receive a gift. If there is effort, if there is training, it's the training to let God do something to you and for you, to carry you. Reminds me of a poem. It's actually on page three of your liturgy. Um, Okay, so yeah, I have a PhD in English literature, and so you're going to hear some poetry this fall. I'm sorry for some of you. Do you guys know what metrophobia is, by the way? You would think it's it's the fear of public transportation, metrophobia. It's actually not. It's the fear of poetry. Yeah, so I apologize for any of you who may have experienced metrophobia from high school. But this kind of training... To receive a gift reminded me of this poem by Wendell Berry, himself a poet, obviously a novelist, an agriculturalist, an economist. 
But this one's called How to Be a Poet to Remind Myself. Here's what Barry writes. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have, inspiration, work, growing older, patience, for patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. A little warning against vanity there. Breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensioned life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it. Of the little words that come out of silence, like prayers prayed back to the one who prays, make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. And there's much to discuss here, and that little poem is a gift for you to take home and ponder. But Barry comes very close to saying at the end what we have said about the Psalms, that they are prayers prayed back to the one who gave us, to the one who's given us something to pray in all seasons of our lives if we can slow down and listen and hear what God is giving us to pray back to him. You know, there is a widespread modern movement today in the West called mindfulness, and it's now practiced by many, including institutions, corporations, universities, um, to help us in the terms of the psalmist calm and quiet our souls, our anxieties, our, our restlessness in the world. And on the West Coast, actually, the, uh, a major figure is Daniel Siegel at UCLA. He's head of something called MARC, the Mindfulness Awareness Research Center. Um, and, and I was taken by the title, I, I own a few books on mindfulness, and I was taken by the title of one of Siegel's books, and it's called Awake, The Science and Practice of Presence. The Science and Practice of Presence. And it struck me how interesting it is that, a, that uh, essentially a secular movement, they're very open about the fact that this is not, this is not religious. Uh, that the science and practice of mindfulness is seeking presence. <laughs> that it said at our very root, what you and I need is presence. And the mindfulness movement is an attempt to help people discover presence. And I've given mindfulness a spin, and it's helpful. Um, there are some tools and some training that it offers. Um, but, you know, I find when I practice mindfulness without God, I get lonely. Because I need a person. I need a, a parent, a father, an Abba. And of course, we don't have to necessarily look for only contemporary movements of mindfulness. We have a long tradition in our faith of a practice of the presence of God. And of course, in just saying that, many of you thought of Brother Lawrence's little classic book, The Practice of the Presence of God. Various forms of contemplative prayer are practicing the presence. Psalm 46.10's command, be still and know that I am God, is a command to practice the presence of God. All prayer, really, at some level, is practicing the presence of God. And often these do require, as Wendell Berry says, slowing down, putting things away, avoiding screens, being present to what is around us. But ultimately what we need to practice is the truth that God is here right now. You know, I've entitled this particular talk, A Pilgrimage to Presence. We think of a pilgrimage as a, as a place we go to find something. But in fact, now that we know in the new covenant, the presence of spirit, that God is always already here, the pilgrimage is not to another place. 
It's to finding God in this place and the next place. Every step is an arrival. Every step in the Christian pilgrimage is an arrival if we find God in it. And the irony of the Christian life is it is both a seeking and a dwelling. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But then he says, the kingdom of God is among you. <laughs> seek what is right here, right now. And in verse 3, finally, the psalmist turns now to the whole congregation and said, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And this reminds us that life as a pilgrimage is often a life of waiting. Um, waiting for God's deliverance. Waiting for God's ways to unfold. The psalmist of 62.15 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. And the psalmist here in our passage said, Often we need to do this together to encourage one another with our own practices as we all wait to see what it is that God, in a time of transition, for instance, is bringing to us, what he is delivering. Rather than secure ourselves against others, we come together and we share with each other how we are finding God right now in this place together. There's a work I have selected, a work of art I've selected for this season, as we often do in our, um, for our series. And it's this one by a Biola University professor, a friend of mine, Jonathan Poles. The original has actually been hanging in my office for many years. And in it, a woman whose face we cannot see is kneeling down and she was absorbed in this tree before us. In the background is a train on its way someplace. The noise and the hurry and the grinding of it is no doubt audible in her background. As it claims, as it churns its way to some destination for some reason. But although she has probably come from somewhere and is on her way somewhere else, she stopped and turned aside to be present, to attend to another living thing. What season is she in? The ground around her is a patchwork of growth and barrenness. The tree, perhaps, in winter, with spring approaching. But whatever season it is, she's looking. She's looking for something in that place. She's listening. She's attending to the moment. It's not hard to sense that this is a moment of stillness, maybe of peace for her. And I'm reminded, reminded of the words on our website, Holy Trinity Church, which says, learning to walk at a different pace, to move slowly enough like Moses that we can turn aside to marvel and listen at the miracle of the lit bush. If you drill down one more level on our website, we come to the words rest, reflect, and redirect. And I know that Jordan has passed on to us this season three of his words for us and their presence and peace and prayer. The Psalms will be our opportunity this fall to practice the presence of God. There are many ways to do it. And many in this congregation have practices, and I encourage you to share your practices with one another. How do you in each day open to the presence of God? How do you walk with him? How are you like a weaned child, calmed and quieted, even as we go about our frantic lives? But in the weeks ahead, I encourage you to let the Psalms give you language to pray back to God, to be the sacred canopy under which everything can be brought to him. To pray back to the one whose words have come out of silence to be prayed back to him so that we might be together with him 
in this season. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.